Hello and uh, welcome to Geeks and Random Thoughts. Uh, today we're talking about the RCEP, a trade agreement uh, between all of the ASEAN countries, including China, Japan, and South Korea. And uh, joining me is Aaron Workington. Uh, my name is Brian Lamb, and we're just going to go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about that and maybe potential impacts as well as uh, some historical context. Take it away. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, the RCEP, uh, or uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, uh, that was actually signed, um, as some may know, uh, November 20th. Is that correct? It was uh, about, so somewhere around there, yeah. Yeah, a couple within, weeks. It, within the last couple of weeks. Yeah, so so the, the signing by the uh, 15 different countries actually marks the end of about what, six, seven years of actual negotiation, which actually started around 2013. So I know uh, in U.S. news, they've kind of made it sound, at least because they <clears throat> haven't given context as if this kind of came out of the uh, TPP, which was uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which the United States left in 17. But in reality, it's actually been hap um, being negotiated for uh, since, like I mentioned, uh, 2013. So it actually has a lot of history. And what it includes is potentially 30% of global GDP. So this is huge. This is, that's bigger than the United States, which is only about 24 to 25% GDP or global domestic uh, product. So um, it's going to have, it will have some effect considering it includes uh, China, Japan, and South Korea, the largest producers of um, of electronics and industrial items. So, yeah, and and uh, this Trans-Pacific uh, Trade Partnership. Well, that's not the official name, but something like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, like Aaron said, the the U.S. dropped out of that for various domestic reasons. Um, pressure from, I would say, some people on the right and some people on the left um, in relation to the like the investor state dispute mechanism. Can't remember exactly the name of it, where corporations would basically get to arbitrate instead of going to those governments to negotiate. They would have special courts to negotiate trade disagreements over environmental labor and uh, other regulations. Uh, I'm just going to actually do a little screen share really quick and then uh, just show you a graph showing the interlockings between the RCEP and the and the Trans-Pacific uh, Trade Agreement. Let's see. So if you can see that, this is kind of the interlockings here. This is the nations of the RCEP, and this is the current uh, CPTPP trade agreement. So they, there is some overlapping here. Yeah, and one thing I want to bring up is the CPTPP <laughs> was <laughs> overlapped with the TPP, which <laughs> the United States withdrew from. And there are so many various agreements, so many various partnerships that overlap with each other. And that's one of the difficulties when it comes to trade agreements, free trade, understanding all of the economics behind it. Uh, the complications or the idiosyncrasies of all these partnerships continue to overlay. So for instance, what we're talking about, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, uh, is at, was actually spearheaded by the Association of Southeast Asian countries. And then China, Japan, and South Korea became involved because they wanted to move this pan-Asian trade block forward at a faster rate. Because um, I think one thing, I think could, correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, one of the reasons the U.S. was involved in the TPP was the belief that this could sort of cordon off China economically. Is that uh, correct? That's what I've read in the past that that was kind of the goal of it, was to contain China and create a counterweight to their massive trade. Yeah. Uh, their massive trade uh, dominance. Well, and one of the concerns, <laughs> of course, intellectual property, um, workers' rights, and then environmental concerns. And those were all wrapped up in there where what what Brian have we Brian and I have read a number of articles this week and they say that this current um, 
partnership doesn't quite have the teeth or is quite as rigorous as the TPP was. So in some commentators' minds, this is more of a political move, uh, more to just show economic um, power in the Pacific and Asia. Interesting. Yeah, um, there's, I mean, I know reading from the details, a lot of it's just mostly tariff-based um, reductions, such as like exports of Japanese uh, sake wine to, to China and, and other things basically like that, where it's going to reduce, I think, like 90% of the tariffs over like 15 years or something like that. Well, and one of the big signatories <clears throat> that was concerned about the reduction of tariffs was uh, India, who actually pulled out. Yeah, yeah, they were concerned that they would get a uh, a flood of cheap man Chinese manufactured goods. There might also be some agricultural impacts that might have impacted them more uh, than what has been actually talked about publicly. Yeah, well, and m mentioning their agricultural concerns, which was brought up in several articles, they've actually had unrest in their country related to their agriculture sector. A lot of farmers are concerned about um, falling prices and devaluation of their products. Yeah. So, exactly. so they, that, <clears throat> that kind of all wraps up into the concerns with uh, specifically China being yeah. able to. And then the interesting thing is uh, in like Australia and China, um, Australia exports probably a third of their exports or something like that to, to China. So they're very trade dependent on China for a lot of money. However, recently, uh, Australia is locally has been a critic of China. And in terms of that, China has uh, put slowdowns on their exports. So I'm not really sure how that all plays into this trade agreement or vice versa. So, <laughs> or if any of the goods that they had just signed, th that they'd signed to reduce tariffs in the in the trade agreement are impacting this current dispute or or not i think there's a lot of hope in these trade agreements that oftentimes um it can quell disputes and they'll hope that well if there's um a larger flow of goods between both countries they become more economically dependent on each other and more likely to resolve any political Issues. I mean, a lot of these trade agreements are in many ways political, sometimes more than economic. Oh, yeah, most definitely. I mean, even if you take even if you take the EU, which started off as uh, a trade agreement, I think the European Community of Nations was it? Or right. Yeah. ECA or whatever the the abbreviation was. I mean, that started as a result of the first two world wars where they actually said as a they actually said we want to start doing this so that it reduces the likelihood of a conflict in the future. Right. Yeah. So, so I think that's also part of this as well. Um, of course, corporations like this, because they can shop around for the lowest labor cost, but that's, that's a whole other story. <laughs> because there wasn't any labor or environmental protections put into this trade agreement. Um, it's it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next you know 15 years to see what businesses move what operations to where yeah i wanted to share real quick um a pie chart that actually shows gdp and in relation to uh global countries so let me see here are you able to see that uh i see a background <laughs> see let me see if i can get this i'm still working on my share capabilities okay uh, other than uh actual uh user flaws <laughs> user <laughs> deficiencies uh, what i'm trying to actually show and i can actually explain this real quick is right now the united states which has about 331 million in population. Like I had mentioned earlier, we're about 24 to 25% of the world GDP. China, which is at one and a half billion, they are currently at about uh, 16 to 17% of the world GDP, but they're growing at an extremely higher or faster rate than we are. Um, they, so they're going to constitute a large portion of the economic power in this um, this partnership. 
So, uh, and there's estimates. I can't figure out where people come up with these estimates, but they were in several articles, including the ones by Brookings, that estimate there will be an addition of 200 billion to global economy over the next uh, 10 years. Interesting. Because of the partnership. Um, I am always curious as to how they develop these statistics, but uh, that's uh, just one statement made. Um, yeah, and the question is always, always for those statistics, where does that money end up flowing, right? Does it end up flowing to, to stock markets? Does it end up flowing to wages? Does it end up flowing to different countries? <laughs> well, it's, it's like when people always talk about, economists talk about GDP per capita, and they say, well, you know, the United States has like $57,000 per capita, but not everybody earns $57,000. Right, right, exactly. It's it's spread unevenly. Yes. Right. And, and free trade, you, you know, that's the controversy between free trade is it does allow potentially lower price goods so that the larger majority of the population can access these goods. But it can also generate a lot of wealth for a smaller group that's involved in the movement of the goods. So, right. and you know, over time, over a fifty to you know a hundred year time frame, you know, everything kind of evens out. But there's definitely always winners and losers in the short term, twenty five to fifty year time frame, which unfortunately can be a multi, you know, majority of someone's life. So yes, yeah. So it will it will be interesting to see how this actually plays out. Um, how powerful this is, if it's more political or economic. But um, as Brian mentions, we will, it's going to be time before we actually see the results of this um, partnership. Exactly. Oh. Uh, well, that's uh, our podcast for today. Um, if you have any comments, uh, please feel free to leave them on our site or subscribe. Thanks. Thank you.